We are good, Ed. Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, this is our fourth session, I guess. Yeah, fourth. And we're, we're hopefully going to get through most of the um, history of the 20th century today, but I won't guarantee that. Um, Ibrahim advises me that if we exceed the planned six sessions, that we have the opportunity to go a couple more as long as it takes to get through the material and as long as your level of interest uh, is maintained. So I do have a lot of material to cover. Quite frankly, um, I've had to remove a, a fair amount of material or this course would be a year long. Uh, it's just, we don't think of our, of our system of money and banking and, and our credit functions as all that complicated but the history of it and the modern you know, system of it is, is extremely complicated. So we're going to pick up the story tonight with the, the gold standard, which, as I've explained, um, precious metals were always thought of as an indicator of national wealth. So the nation that hold the most gold and most silver in their vaults was, by definition, the wealthiest, the most powerful. But the... Uh, the idea of using gold as a security for currency that's in circulation or gold coinage or silver coinage for exchange has always had criticisms um, because of some of the practical issues associated with uh, precious metals, not the least of which today is the environmental cost of, of mining the ores, refining the ores, minting the, the metal into coinage, and then storing it in a vault somewhere with intense security. So it's a hugely costly way to create money. Uh, and so that part of, part of the system has always been under some criticism. But probably the most important criticism in the early part of the 20th century was simply the whole idea of moving the money from one uh, participant to another based on the uh, balance of trade issues. So if your country was not exporting sufficient goods to bring in the money, you were going to have to settle those accounts in gold and vice versa. Well, it did have the virtue of of the fact that governments could not arbitrarily or very easily increase or decrease the nation's currency supply. Um, as I mentioned just before we started in class, um, it ne doesn't necessarily mean the governments couldn't cheat. Um, you know, who's auditing the system? Who's, who's making sure that the records are accurate, that there's actually so much gold stock in the, the vaults of the central banks or you know, in the U.S. case in Fort Knox or some other some other locations, so there's that part of the of the system. It has to be uh, audited and to ensure that it that it's being honestly administered. Uh, moreover, linking the money supply to gold prevented governments from effective intervention during times of rising unemployment when. Uh, when people are unemployed and business uh, activity is, is declining, what we need is to expand the amount of credit that's in circulation or directly, as we're doing today, inter, inter, inject money into the economy so that people have money in their pockets to spend, to invest in capital goods if you're a business, et cetera. And so um, if you're on the gold standard and you have a specific ratio of your currency and circulation to gold, then you're, you're kind of stuck. Uh, if, you, if you, in fact, live up to the system. Well, just to get some historical perspective on, on the 20th century, think about the World War, the First World War in 1914. This caused countries to suspend gold exports and to enact laws that restricted the private gold market. Um, Rather than increasing taxes on, the, on those with the greatest ability to pay, of course, uh, and those who had most to lose in the event that their country was defeated, governments sold bonds to, to raise revenue. Um, so it, it presents this interesting quandary that the government is afraid to, 
to tax those who have the money to be taxed, um, but is perfectly willing to issue bonds sold to those very same people with interest. So now you have the government taking on debt and must somehow raise revenue just to pay the interest on the debt uh, that they could have acquired via taxation. And then later on in our, our discussions, we'll talk about you know, what would happen if they simply decided to print money as, as they eventually would do during wartime. So uh, as always occurs during war, prices increased and the international monetary system pretty much unraveled for that, that time period. Um, inflation has many different definitions. The one that is most common is inflation is when there is more money chasing less, less goods. So if you have a reduction in the supply of co consumer products during war, what's going to happen to the price of those goods? Well, the prices are gonna increase which is why in wartime, rationing is considered to be an appropriate you know, measure for government to take on. So that supposedly no one benefits uh, unduly and others suffer unduly. Well, for the people of the United States, the end of the war left the nation with a real challenge of demobilization. There were some three and one half million Americans that had gone into military service. A dramatic, you know, unbelievable increase in the U.S. military from what had existed prior to 1917. And uh, the young adults of that generation have been described by historians as the lost generation. And uh, you know, a number of reasons you might think of for that, for those those young adults as being part of this lost generation. You know, one thing is they're maturing in the 1920s and when most people are beginning to feel a certain amount of security in their lives, the 1930s occur and nobody has security or very few people have security. The other thing that's happening, happens again after the second world war when you think of it, is mobility. So young men and some young women who are born and raised in rural parts of America. They get, they enlist in the military. They go to a different place for training. They are assigned to different uh, you know, cities where they're stationed and then overseas. And so it adds to the American idea of mobility. People are on the move. And so they're discovering that, geez, there are better places to live than where my parents uh, you know, settled and where I grew up. And people began to migrate into the cities as well. So we experienced a pretty significant movement from rural to urban locations after the First World War. Well, uh, think about this. What do, what do young people do uh, when they get into their 20s? When, when some of you may have served in the military, uh, when you came back from your military duty, Maybe you were a single person, and the next thing on your mind might have been what? Marriage. Finding a mate, uh, yes. you know, settling down, building a family, et cetera. And so you had, you had that phenomenon after the First World War as well. And what does that do for your, your money, banking, and credit system? Well, it increases demand for housing. And unless you're very lucky and you're able to save enough to purchase your, your residential property for cash, you're going to be looking for uh, bank credit, uh, someone to make you a mortgage loan. Um, and I, I'm going to add a little parenthetical comment here. Uh, because I, I made my, my uh, business career in the financial sector and was a mortgage loan officer, uh, it always, it always troubles me that everyone says, I'm going to get a mortgage um, because that's really technically not what you get. You get a loan and your loan is then secured by a mortgage lien on that residential property that gives the mortgage holder the first lien position in the event that something happens and you can't make your loan payments. So you don't get a mortgage you sign a mortgage because you're, you're basically subordinating your interest in the property to that of the, 
mortgage holder, the lending institution. So uh, you can think about that. That's, that's just one of the things I, I, I've often bothered by when I hear how, how uh, the industry is, is described in the, in the media and common language. So what happens? Well, uh, inflation begins to eat away at household incomes, of course, and workers responded. So we have in the 1920s, early 1920s, a long series of strikes and lockouts. Um, you know, uh, workers feel like they are not getting a fair shake. And so unions begin to, the union movement begins to strengthen in the 1920s. It actually took just a couple years till 1923 for the economy in the United States to begin a new expansion. Uh, but it was not a universal expansion. Farmers who had uh, increased their production during the war, uh, they took on a lot of new debt, and now they were facing serious problems servicing that debt as commodity prices were falling. falling. Um, you just think about it very simply. During a wartime, the war took place across Europe. Uh, <clears throat> farmers in Europe weren't able to plant and harvest crops, so imports of foodstuffs had to increase. And they came from the places where there was no uh, battles going on. So the United States agricultural sector expanded enormously to meet this need. Well, after the war, the European farmers began to clear the, mun the unexploded munitions out of their fields uh, and began to plant and harvest crops. And so the supply of agricultural commodities increased. And in the United States and some other countries, where the farmers were still producing based on the anticipated demand during the war, commodity prices were falling and they were beginning to experience serious trouble. Um, I've referred to this book before, I believe, but it is one that I really recommend to you to pick up and read about the 1920s. Uh, excuse me just a second, I'll be right back. I need to close my door. <clears throat> My, my wife was down the hall and she's on the phone uh, talking to someone and, and seeming to have a very nice time laughing. So I don't know if you picked up any, any noise in the background from her. But anyway, I wanted to close the door. So Frederick Lewis Allen is, is a, a, a journalist slash historian. And he wrote a series of books covering the 1920s to the 1950s. And they're all really well researched and, and very easy reading, entertaining. Um, and his book only yesterday is has has a lot of keen insights into what was going on in the 1920s that led to the Great Depression. He says about the uh, agricultural sector, he writes, between 1919 and 1926, the national production of milk and milk products increased by one third and the acreage of 19 commercial truck vegetable crops nearly doubled. But the growers of staple crops, such as wheat and corn and cotton, were in a bad way, again, because of the decline in international demand for these staple crops. He goes on to say, their foreign markets had dwindled under competition from other countries, and the more efficient the poor farmer became, the more machines he bought he, he bought to increase his output, the more surely he and his fellows were faced by the specter of overproduction. And that's a, that brings up an, a, a little comment on economics that economists have always talked about this idea of overproduction. More is being produced than those in the economy will consume. And the question has always been, is it failure to consume because people have already consumed everything that they want to consume in that in those areas or is it because they simply don't have the income you know to purchase the goods that are being produced so certainly there was no uh, shortage of need in the 1920s there are plenty of people who needed these products uh, to have a better life a better uh, diet etc but incomes were low 
The government back in the 1920s, however, was not about to simply issue checks to people uh, or increase their income in that way. There was no social security benefits yet for, for anyone. Uh, you're pretty much on your own based on your, your own ability to support yourself and your extended family and maybe phil philanthropic contributions in your community. But, uh, but the question of whether or not there was actually overproduction is, is one of definition. Uh, but, but a lot of stuff was rotting. It wasn't, there was a lot of goods being produced that just weren't going anywhere and no one was buying them. And so prices certainly came down. There were other problems uh, obscured by the tremendous increase in, in, for example, the sale of automobiles. Oops, sorry about that. Um, and, and this was a, a major time of innovation. So after the First World War, you know, Henry Ford was producing an enormous number of, of new Model Ts. Uh, there was the first radios that were being produced. Now people could communicate with, with the outside world by having a radio. So you live in the middle of Montana somewhere. Um, and how do you find out the news? Well, now you have the opportunity to listen to a radio that, that not very many years before wasn't, wasn't available. And many other consumer products started to come onto the market, uh, you know, uh, as simple things as a, as a, as a washing machine or a vacuum cleaner, you know, a lot of a lot of products becoming available. And here's what Frederick Lewis Allen observed with regard to this this new increase in production and by what he what he defined as a moderate prosperity. He said prosperity was assisted by two new stimulants to purchasing, each of which mortgaged the future but kept the factories roaring while it was being injected. The first was the increase in installment buying. The other stimulant was stock market speculation. When stocks were skyrocketing in 1928 and 1929, it is probable, probable that hundreds of thousands of people were buying goods with money, which represented essentially a gamble on the business profits of the 1930s. So an expectation, things are getting good, they're going to stay good, they're going to be good for as long as we can foresee in the future. And so let's get in on the game. And this element of installment buying, when you think about it today, um, eventually we'll talk about it, automobiles, how many people today really pay cash for a new automobile, a major purchase? Almost every, not everyone, but but a large percentage of our of our you know, buying population buy an automobile on credit, and these days, eventually, we'll hit on this subject. Too many automobile loans are of the subprime character. In other words, people still need an automobile to get to work because they can't afford to live close enough to their place of employment, so they need an automobile and they don't have the savings to purchase it for cash, and maybe their credit rating, what's called the FICO credit score, uh, is too low to get a conventional loan from a bank or some other institutional lender. And so they go into the subprime market, they pay a high rate of interest, uh, and they might have conditions attached to that loan, like a uh, prepayment penalty, or some other kinds of fees that make the loan extremely expensive for people who are already marginally able to handle the credit. So it sets up you know, a lot of opportunity for problems if the country hits a snag. If there is a downturn in employment, a downturn in the economy, a recessionary downturn, you have all this debt outstanding and uh, people not perhaps having the ability to keep up with their payments. Well, in this brave new world of financial and economic innovation, other economists around the world weighed in on the risks, and they offered a range of views on how public policies were supported or not supported by economic theory. This is a period of a lot of discussion about, about the fundamentals of, of what, what is referred to as neoclassical economic theory. Um, is it really applicable to a modern, rapidly industrializing economy? Uh, 
Is, is what was happening in the late 1800s, early 1900s still the same or have things fundamentally changed? And economists were debating you know, the mon monetary systems during this whole period, and particularly the gold standard and the idea of central banking. All of those, all of those institutional questions were under debate. Well, leaders from 34 nations came together at a meeting in Genoa, Italy in 1922 to address problems of rebuilding a defeated Germany and rebuilding the countries of Eastern Europe. The one policy they all agreed upon was to resume the gold standard. Uh, they looked back and said, the gold standard is the one thing we can rely on to discipline countries. Uh, and according to economic, orthodox economic theory, it would keep the global economy from experiencing potential for inflation. Uh, and you have a combination of objectives here, economic stability, sustained growth, and taming inflation. And the belief was that, that the gold standard was pretty much the tool to do this. Well, 1924 comes and Winston Churchill in Britain is appointed by the Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin as Britain's new Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, now, I studied Winston Churchill's life. Uh, to my knowledge, he never took a course at Oxford or Cambridge or any university in monetary theory. But uh, he was appointed Chancellor of the Exchequer. And he then began to listen to leading economists and officials at the Bank of England. And they urged him to support Britain's return to the gold standard at the pre-war parity. Now, a lot had changed. I mean, uh, you know, Britain wasn't invaded, but its economy was pretty much in shambles in the early 1920s. Uh, and returning Britain to gold on the pre-war parity meant that Britain would have to um, be an export-oriented economy in order to prevent gold from leaving the country. And this is at a time when there are great shortages. Their own people are struggling you know, to, to meet their own needs. And this decision would have a tremendous impact on, on Britain. Well, Churchill defended this decision a couple of years later this way. He wrote, in carrying out a great change like the return to the gold standard, it has been necessary to move with extreme care. So many objects have to be kept in view at this same moment that delicacy and judgment are required at every step. I think that in the Treasury and in the Bank of England, we have the most skillful advisors and, finance, and financiers that any country can show. At any rate, they are all respected all over the world. So there is no reason why they should be looked down upon at home. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Alec, Alec is, is uh, chuckling, so. Yeah. Uh, um, very, very forcefully. <laughs> yeah, it, go ahead. No, no, that, uh, I mean, that's uh, young Churchill. <laughs> yeah, pretty young. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think he mostly was talking nonsense, but nevertheless. Well, he was talking orthodoxy. Orthodoxy, You know, yeah. when, you're, when your experts all tell you that this is what we need to do, and again, you may not have any better ideas yourself, then uh, that's the advice you're going to follow. Ed, do you know what, um, what Keynes was uh, thinking? That was uh, after this, the First World War where he walked out of the Treaty of Versailles talks. Yes. Uh, because of the- Yeah, Keynes, yeah. Uh, Keynes was very critical of this decision. Yeah, uh, he had he had written his own treatise after the after the war, you know, yeah. and, and treatise on money, yes, on money. Yeah. So it's I get Keynes was like anyone cr crying out, trying to sound warnings, yes. and only when disaster hit, it seems, did Keynes finally gain recognition. He was 
he was the person who said, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. Um, anyway, he's not the only one, but, but, uh, but eventually he is listened to. Now, Britain's economy at this time, the real economy, meaning the, the, the producing goods and providing services, had not yet recovered from the war. And there was a growing trade deficit. So again, this caused a drain on Britain's gold stock. And it forced Britain in 1931 to finally seize the use of gold to settle its accounts. So, you know, from a, you have to think of, of Churchill in, in, in a sense as he is throughout his career, a defender of the empire. Yes. He sees Britain as the dominant uh, uh, imperial presence. And so how do you not lead if you're in that position? And he didn't realize that the country's economy was not strong enough to take that leading position and to hold to it. So by 1931, uh, Britain is forced to, to uh, basically get off the gold standard. Many other countries followed for very similar reasons. The United States, however, merely increased the price of gold from $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce to slow the loss of gold stocks. So uh, it arbitrarily just changed the price to $35 and said, from now on, uh, you know, every ounce of gold we'll give you will cost you $35. Um, any country could have, you know, certainly have done that. They could have increased it to $50 or $75 or whatever they would want to do. Um, the question is then, well, would other countries stop trading with you because you did this? Um, probably not. Well, Churchill explained to his countrymen that the policies of the United States were, in fact, in his view, uh, preventing a global economic recovery. He, he wrote or declared in a speech, the unwholesome accumulation of gold in the only two countries which benefit from those uneconomic and non-commercial payments of war debts has largely paralyzed world credit, checked the flow of trade, paralyzed prices, especially the prices of prime commodities, and has made it impossible for millions of workers on both sides of the Atlantic to earn their daily bread. So here again, he's looking at, at, at the U.S. policies regarding gold as key to why the economies had stalled. Um, and this is unforgivable of Churchill, actually, because you know, as a young liberal candidate in 1909, he had campaigned across the country for his first seat in the House of Commons, giving speeches that could have sound, sounded like they could have come right out of Henry George's book, Progress and Poverty. Yeah. He, he, he indicated he understood the relationship of land uh, monopoly to economic uh, booms and busts. But somehow during this period, uh, he totally forgot that there was any such connection. Um, but he's not the only one. I mean, it, uh, and he's in a very different position. Well, okay. So to get back to Keynes, in 1925, uh, he's response to Churchill's actions with this stern indictment. This is, you know, right when it's about to happen. He says, partly, because perhaps because he has no instinctive judgment to prevent him, prevent him from making mistakes, partly because lacking this instinctive judgment, he was deafened by the clamorous voices of conventional finance, and most of all, because he was gravely misled by his experts. So, uh, you know, Keynes was, was, was trying to put forward a warning as he saw it. Um, now, I have to say also that Keynes was blind to the importance of land markets in his own society. Uh, if you read through just about everything he wrote, he always thought that the idea of, um, of land rent was very minor, of minor importance in the economy. And he ignored uh, urban land markets in his writings which is really surprising because he was an investor and I don't know what his real estate holdings were, but he certainly understood how land markets worked for those who speculated in land and real estate. But the connection between that 
and economic outcomes were, you know, he was blind to that as far as I can tell from my research. If anyone else knows Keynes better than I do uh, and want to speak up on behalf of him, I'm willing, I'm eager to learn. Well, more attention should have been paid to the insights of another young economist, uh, economics professor at this time, a guy named Harry Gunnison Brown. He, he had earned his uh, doctorate at Yale and came out with his first book in 1914 titled International Trade and Exchange. And in his book, he warned against the resort to protective tariffs. Uh, he thought that this was a terrible way to try to achieve a positive balance of trade. And of course, uh, in the late 1920s, the United States embarked on a, a series of protective tariffs, most famous of which is the Harley Smoot or Smoot Harley tariff. And that was what Churchill was alluding to, not only the increase in the price of gold, but the imposition by the United States of a high tariff on imports in the effort to protect US domestic production. But you know, every other country is going to retaliate. And so what's the net effect? If everybody follows the same game plan, then you're going to have uh, a, a reduction in global economic activity, which is exactly what happened in the 1930s. Harry Gasson Brown wrote, the first effect of protection is to raise the prices of protected goods by not more than the amount of the tariff without affecting money wages. The secondary effect of protection resulting from the inflow of money, so far as protection occasions, occasions such an inflow, is to raise prices of unprotected goods and money wages, and to further raise the prices of protected goods. So in his opinion, it is a no-win situation. In the short run, it's going to benefit those who are producing protected goods, uh, but the cost of everything is going to go up, and so eventually the any benefit that's achieved that's going to be narrow is going to harm the entire economy as a whole. So he's basically arguing the case for free trade. And if things aren't going as well as expected, it must be something else. Uh, and, and Harry Gunnison Brown was someone who had at least studied Henry George and, and understood the importance of land markets in the economy. Well, we're pretty familiar, I think, all of us by now of what actually eventually occurred. So the credit fuel and speculation driven stock market crashed on the 29th of October, 1929. Investors at that moment owed $7 billion for stocks bought on margin. Uh, I don't even know what the transfer, maybe someone knows the conversion rate. I didn't bother to look it up. What that would be to, in today's money. $7 billion in 1929, probably, you know, 700 billion. I don't know, I don't know what the number would be. But less than two weeks earlier, when a nation's most admired economist, Irving Fisher, famously told an audience that stock prices had reached what looks like a permanently high plateau. Um, <clears throat> now, I have to give Irving Fisher credit. He he acted on what he believed to be true. He uh, had an um, he had a portfolio in early 1929 that was very large, and he had an estimated 100 million dollar net worth. And he went out and bought and bought and bought stocks on margin. And when the crash occurred, uh, he went broke. Uh, and the research that I found on him, he had to sell his property and move in with family. After all, all that, he, I mean, what goes up went down for him in a very dramatic way. Um, that part of his story is, is not normally told, but, but I um, found out by, by reading an article by someone who wrote, wrote on Fisher, uh, what actually happened to him. So, by mid-November 1929, billions of paper profits had disappeared. A growing number of the nation's banks, who were already financially stressed by losses incurred from uh, loans that went bad, made to speculators in Florida land, 
uh, and other other loans that had uh, gone bad for farmers in the uh, agricultural sector, as well as many uh, mortgage loans, particularly commercial mortgage loans that uh, defaulted, developers defaulted because the demand for new office space uh, that everyone thought was going to continue to increase just never materialized. And so you had a fair number of new buildings or partially built buildings where the developers uh, defaulted on their construction loans. And so there is, a, there is by, this, by the early 1930s, just a, uh, an avalanche of bank failures. And, and Florida, as Frederick Al Lewis Allen writes, was just one of the sources of these bank losses. And here's what he says uh, in Young Yesterday. The Florida boom, in fact, was only one, and by all odds, the most spectacular of a series of land and building booms during the post-war decade, each of which had its marked effect upon the national economy and the national life. At the very outset of the decade, there had been a sensational market in farmlands caused by the phenomenal prices brought by wheat and other crops during and immediately after the war. And finally, he says this, prices of farm property leaped, thousands of mortgages and loans were based upon these exaggerated values. And when the bottom dropped out of the agricultural markets in 1920-21, the distress of the farmers was intensified by the fact that in innumerable cases, they could not get money enough from their crops to cover the interest due at the bank or pay the taxes, which were now levied on the increased valuation. Thousands of country banks saddled with mortgage loans and loans in default ultimately went to the wall. Now, in that statement, there is a sort of hidden message that, of public policy that is worth repeating a little bit. And he, he talks about, he says, or pay the taxes which were now levied on the increased valuation. <clears throat> well, uh, those of you who own a property, how often has your property been revalued for tax purposes? Have, have you noticed any pattern there? Rarely. Never? Rarely. Rarely. No, it's, it's we're valued much more now, right? much more regularly. And the, the valuation on the, the, the old family home, they overdid it and we had to get, a, um, get it revalued and they brought it down. So it's did it's, you make an it, appeal? You had to individually yeah, appeal? Yeah, we made an appeal and the value actually came out. He said that they do it by Google Maps now. They just look at the look at the uh, the house by Google Maps. And we said, well, it's not as it's not as valuable as what you're saying it is. It's nowhere near. So they, they knocked a hundred thousand dollars off. So it wasn't much, but it was uh, it was a, a better than nothing. Well, uh, $100,000 in valuation, uh, it sounds like a significant potential savings. But the, the, the key thing here is that administrating, administering these, these, these tax assessments is uh, a cumbersome process. Um, you know, in, in how do you know, you know what sort of uh, you know, changes have been made in, a, in the interior of a property unless they... The, the owners have recently uh, applied for some sort of construction permit that's required, et cetera. Um, and the, the, the tendency is, at least this is the case in the United States, um, that property values are reassessed not very frequently. Um, yeah. And so you, you, have, you have a long period where property values are changing land values are, are, are changing. Um, some are going up and some are going down, but the assessments are not being adjusted to uh, accurately yeah. reflect those changes. So, so in, in a sense here, after the First World War, with, with farmland values falling in response to the lack of, uh, of demand for commodities, um, 
they are people are being overtaxed now whether or not there was a, an opportunity for them to go in and make an appeal uh it doesn't seem to have affected from what Frederick Lewis Allen wrote, the number of farmers that fell into uh, serious debt and eventually lost their farms at foreclosure. So we have, you know, the makings of, it, of an enormous um, agricultural crisis in the United States in the 1920s. And then it gets worse and worse as the 1930s go on. Now, as country after country sank into the into deeper into recession, their their reaction was to attempt to protect domestic producers again by an introducing tariffs. And at the time in the United States, President Herbert Hoover signed this famous Smoot Hawley Tariff Act into law. It took effect in June of 1930. And as I, I indicated, the world's other nations retaliated. And it, as international trade began to contract, this only deepened the recession and you know, could be considered a major cause of, of the global depression that, that then occurred. Another shock to the economy also occurred in 1930. Um, this is a, one of the strange stories of the depression related to the financial system. Those of you outside of the United States have probably never heard this story. Uh, probably most of you, even in the United States, have never heard it, but, but it is a story that uh, was picked up by the economist Milton Friedman. He and his wife wrote uh, a book uh, uh, on, on money that, that uh, contained this story. Well, in 1930, there was a New York City bank that was founded in 1913 by a Jewish immigrant to the United States, states named Joseph Marcus. Um, and in 1930, the bank began to experience some cash flow problems caused by rapid growth after a series of mergers. Uh, the bank had become public in 1929 and was now, at that point, the third largest bank in the city. Uh, it then became public knowledge that additional merger plans were dropped because the bank could not guarantee the safety of deposits. And this caused a panic. Depositors began to come to the bank to get their money out, and uh, a large proportion of the bank's assets were in the form of real estate mortgage loans, so there was no real viable secondary market for mortgage loans at the time, so the bank was really dependent upon the Federal Reserve to help it out. Um, well, unfortunately, the name of this bank was the Bank of the United States. So when the above information was made public, there was a run on the bank's office in the Bronx in New York. Uh, runs on other branches soon followed, and the bank was finally forced to close its doors. Depositors lost an estimated $550 million. Uh, worse still, because the bank's name, of the bank's name, people all across the United States thought that the nation's financial system had collapsed. You see in the news, the Bank of the United States closes its door. Well, you know, um, that's not good news. <laughs> so uh, uh, Milton Friedman basically tells us in the book that one of the reasons the Federal Reserve, probably the primary reason the Federal Reserve failed to come in and help this bank was because it was Jewish owned. So. Uh, Benjamin Strong was known pretty much as an anti-Semite, and so he took no action to bail out the bank and, in fact, um, helped to trigger the national you know, banking panic because of his narrow-mindedness. Whether or not the Fed, the Fed intervention would have stabilized the situation and then uh, prevented the panics that followed is, is conjecture, but it seems reasonable to think that it would have certainly uh, helped the situation. Well, things were pretty bad. The financial system is looking like it's collapsing. Banks everywhere are closing their doors. Millions of people are losing their life savings that are held in these banks. And the, the, the uh, uh, nation decided it needed different leadership. And Franklin D. Roosevelt was elected president in 1932. Uh, 
Anybody know uh, what Roosevelt's campaign message was about the economy? Well, uh, it wasn't the New Deal. It, it, was, it was, let's uh, balance the budget, let's lower taxes, and let's uh, reduce government spending. Well, that, you know, that, that was orthodox economic advice, um, but the nation was facing, as all nations at the time were facing, much more difficult uh, uh, challenges from an economic standpoint. Um, Herbert Hoover actually urged Franklin Roosevelt to work with the other leading industrial nations to come to an agreement on a currency stabilization program and then commit to remain on the international gold standard. And Roosevelt, however, decided with advice from uh, his brain trust that the United States should act unilaterally, um, which was not a good decision because the United States as uh, powerful an economy as it had was not independent of world, world forces. There were still the United States was becoming very much of an export dominated society, uh, even though its own, its own consumption was high. But we were, we had tremendous increases in production. You have to have a market for that stuff. If you don't, if you can't sell it all to your own citizens, well, you have to be able to sell it somewhere. And, uh, and if you don't have uh, a stable monetary system, then prices for those goods and services are going to be all over the place. And, and it's going to be very difficult to maintain profitability for your exports. Well, say, so Ed, yes, the question here. Surely, uh, do you know, when um, FDR was beginning to communicate with Keynes, who was in Cambridge at the time, and when he was convinced either by Keynes or by other forces, to uh, reverse that in uh, these policies and start doing what we now recognize as the new deal. Yeah, I, I, I will get into that shortly, but okay, to, the immediate answer to your question is that uh, he did not communicate with Keynes. Keynes wrote an open letter to the president of the United States that was published uh, you know, in various newspapers uh, and basically tried to give him the same advice that he had given to the British government and the British government had uh, decided to listen to Keynes, at least to some extent. So uh, what was happening at the moment was there was a, a, to be a, an economic conference in London in the summer of 1933. Um, and rather than wait for this conference and for an international agreement to occur, Roosevelt just went ahead and devalued the dollar and removed the U.S. from the international gold standard. So when the economic situation worsened instead of improved, Roosevelt realized he had made a serious mistake. Um, now, I don't know which of his economic advisors, his team, he had listened to on this question, but, uh, but he... It took, it took from 1933 until 1936 to finally come to terms with the other major trading partners. So in 1936, he at least, the United States reached some agreements on, uh, on trade and, and monetary stabilization with Britain and France. So again, it's still unilateral. This is not 30 countries getting together and all agreeing to a uniform policy. It's it's U.S. negotiating with Britain, U.S. negotiating with France, and coming up with, with an agreement that seemed to make sense for them. Now, <clears throat> I haven't been able to find any figures on compliance with the uh, executive order that Roosevelt gave about gold. But this is a, the notice of it. May, uh, on or before May of 1933, everybody said, turn in all your gold. Now, <laughs> um, I don't know if, if federal authorities ever came to individual homes and said, OK, it's time for you to sell all your gold to the government at, 
They were paid $20.67 per troy ounce of gold. Uh, how much was turned in, I really don't know. They, I, I guess because that wasn't considered enough of an inducement to get people to comply, they raised it to $35 the next year. And so it gave the government a significant windfall profit on the early gold that was turned in. So whatever gold came in at $20 was now revalued on the books at $35. Now, historians estimate that the government then held about 6,000 metric tons of gold. At the $35 price, that would have brought the value up to $7 billion. Um, so if you're looking at what governments think is a good thing, how much currency in circulation, value of currency in circulation is being supported by gold valued at $7 billion, even though if you take your, your, your paper currency to the mint, they're not going to give you an ounce of gold uh, you know, during this period of time. Well, other measures were certainly necessary. And so the Congress passed the Emergency Banking Act on March 9th, uh, under which the Federal Reserve System was authorized to provide whatever cash was needed by the banks that were still thought to be strong enough to remain open. So a lot of banks were, were hurting. They were experiencing a lot of loan losses, but they still had a good deal of, of uh of paying assets. Between 1929 and 1933, however, 10,000 banks across the nation failed. Um, I did not research bank failures in, in any of the other countries during the depression, but uh, one had, I, I would safely assume that the same process was occurring in most other countries uh, in the world at the time. Um, but, Interestingly enough, all these banks failed, and yet uh, once the country had greater confidence that Roosevelt's New Deal was going to work or, or begin to accomplish things, people brought their money back. And so about two-thirds of the currency that had been taken out of the banks came back in uh, to the surviving banks. Now, it was also uh, the result of some other significant changes in you know, the legal structure of banking in the United States. Um, one thing that was deemed really important at the time was the signing of what was called the Glass-Steagall Act. And this act prohibited the mixing of banking, securities, and insurance businesses. Um, and that the Glass-Steagall Act remained in force all the way up through to the Clinton administration. It was not a conservative Republican who, who signed the law that eliminated the distinction between commercial banking and investment banking. It was signed by a Democratic president in the United States. Um, I'd be interested to know if other countries have a have any such prohibition or restriction or pretty much have gone along with the the big banking trend uh, across, around the world stimulated by the United States actions if you know I'd love to hear that anyway the other thing that happened was the establishment of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation so for the first time uh, banks would be required to sign up if they're taking deposits that are going to be federally insured, they would become part of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and they would be assessed premiums based on the FDIC's analysis of their financial strength. So not all banks would pay the same premium, just like, you know, as individuals, we uh, are whatever we're, we're undertaking, we're, we're trying to get insurance for, the insurance company assesses us for our risk and prices for that risk and charges us accordingly. So that gave people confidence that I can put my money back into the banks. And if the bank goes under, the federal government will return to me the balance uh, of my deposit up to a certain limit. Well, 
as the country slipped deeper and deeper into an economic recession, uh, the American Keynes appeared. Alec, this is this is part of the story that that is is pretty interesting. Um, a Republican banker from Utah, his name is Mariner Eccles, came to Washington D.C. to testify before the U.S. Senate Finance Committee. Uh, about the whole financial structure and, and, and the problems with banking. He held very strong views on what had brought the nation to its knees. And in his testimony, he, here's what he said. In the mad confusion and fear brought about by our present disordered economy, we need bold and courageous leadership more than at any time in our history for the reason that our industrial revolution has made necessary a new economic philosophy, a new business point of view, and a fundamental change in our social system. What did he mean by that? Specifically, the operation of our money world has failed to be our servant and instead is our tyrant and master. So <clears throat> for his troubles in Washington, uh, Roosevelt was urged by the Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau Jr., to appoint Eccles as the new chairman of the Federal Reserve. So soon after his confirmation, uh, Eccles embarked on reorganization of the Federal Reserve Board. They began to promote the policies that would be the cornerstones of the New Deal. And uh, he had never read Keynes. He had no idea who John Maynard Keynes really was. Um, at hearings held in March on the proposed Banking Act of 1935, he explained why these new measures were needed. He says, the present need is to so modify our banking law as to encourage the banking system to give a full measure of cooperation to efforts at economic recovery. It is even more important from the longer time point of view to so modify our banking structure and administration as to have it become an influence toward the modernization, the moderation of fluctuations in employment, trade, and business. Very Keynesian. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and, Ed, he still uh, does. He still believe that uh, we can make changes for the economy through monetary policy rather than Keynes's of uh, fiscal uh, orientation, borrowing money by the government, by selling bonds and then spending it on the economy as eventually uh, what we arrived at. Eccles is a very pragmatic banking person. Uh, he, sees, he sees the role of banking to foster the increase in economic activity. And, and so he believes that, that it's, the, it's the role of the Federal Reserve to live up to that promise. It's dual obligation. One is to promote uh, monetary stability um, and control inflation. And uh, at the same time, be there to provide the credit that's necessary for the economy to expand as the demand for credit expands. So here, here, let me go on to what he says in addition to, to what I just showed you. He said, this would tend not only to avoid the particular evils that came to a head in 1928, 1929, but to so regulate underlying conditions as to diminish the possibility of a speculative boom getting underway. For when speculation is once underway, it is extremely difficult to control. And the only means of preventing excesses is to combat conditions that are favorable to their inception and early development. Yeah, yeah. So, so from Eccles point of view, one of the real, one of the real problems of the cause of, of the depression was the imprudent uh, use of credit. You know, it, basically he's on the side of, 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 of bankers in the sense that bankers know how to appropriately determine the credit worthiness of borrowers. And as long as they adhere to those uh, analytics, then yes, things would, can go wrong because you, can't, you cannot forecast shocks to the system. 
but the system will be strong enough to sustain those shocks. But when you start to think that what is going up is always going to go up, continue to go up, and you start abandoning your prudent lending practices as a banker or as the Federal Reserve or, or as, as the government, then you're setting yourself up for disaster. And, specula and his indication is if you see an increase in speculation in the economy, in stock market, in real estate market, then you know you're headed for trouble. And it is then the obligation, in his view, of the central bank to take measures that will uh, kill off the speculative activity. And he would look not just to the monetary system, not just to the Fed, but look to Congress and, leg and legislative uh, action as well to, to, to take effect, to do what is necessary to, to for example, in, I don't know that... I can't remember if he ever wrote about this or not, but I would suspect he would be supportive of, uh, of a high tax rate on so-called capital gains that are, that are gained in the short run. In other words, um, you know, we have, we have a, in the United States, a two level tax rate for short-term and long-term capital gains. And he would certainly be in favor of imposing a high rate of taxation on gains that are taken by by speculators. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Now I don't know if I don't know if he would go all the way with me. My own view is that that um, in the real world there are no such things as capital gains. Real tangible capital assets all depreciate uh, over time. Uh, they rarely, if ever, sell for more than their acquisition cost. If they do, it's because they become a collectible. Uh, <clears throat> you know, so like, like for example, certain buildings in a city have historic designation, and so you know they might sell for more than uh, you know comparable buildings because of that historic designation. But uh, but generally speaking, tangible assets all depreciate, and so. Uh, we don't really experience capital gains. We experience the capitalization of imputed rent income, which is unearned to individuals. And so my, my view of what we ought to have as a system that treats all income the same, and no preferential treatment over how income is derived, but exempt a certain level of income for individuals, like up to, let's say, the national median. And we could get a much more progressive uh, tax system that basically captures far more revenue from unearned speculation and passive investment. We can have a long discussion about that, but uh, I won't bore you with any more. Well, <clears throat> although Eccles had no academic credentials in economics, his, his thinking on how to jumpstart the U.S. economy was, as I said, pure Keynesian. In an address he delivered at the University of Pennsylvania in 1936, he explained his reasoning this way. He says, he says, obviously what was needed to absorb excess capacity generally was an increased demand arising from increased consumer buying power. And here it seems to me is the crux of the matter. Increased demand could come about only as a result of increased incomes and increased incomes depended upon increased disbursements by industry or by government or by both. Yeah. Yeah. 1936, fast forward to 2021. And uh, there's the advice that he would give to the current you know, heads of government anywhere. Uh, get money in the hands of people and get them to spend it and the economy will recover. Uh, that's his view. Now, are there any consequences for that? Um, that's the balancing act that, that, that would have to be played by, by, by fiscal policy uh, to make sure that it doesn't necessarily stimulate price increases in inflation. So how much money are you going to give to people put it in their pocket? Um, uh, Ed, how do you? Ed, may I ask a question on this? Because that's exactly the question I had. Does he give a, a preference on who should be going first? Industry, 
like industry first should be incentivized to disperse whatever profit they have made. And then if that's not possible for X, Y, Z reasons, let's discuss them another way, then government should go or they should go in parallel or government should lead. Do we have any insight on what Eccles thought on that? Um, I'd have to look at some of his additional speeches as the depression went on. But uh, Eccles, as I said, was not uh, orthodox. He was very pragmatic. So while his ideas sound very Keynesian, um, up to, to my knowledge, at that point, he was not familiar with Keynes's writing. Whether he later studied Keynes and decided based on that whether or not the money should be directly issued to individuals as consumers or a good bit of it should go, go directly to uh, spending by government to acquire infrastructure, for example, I don't know. Um, I... Um, I mean, he's at the center of power at this period of time. And there is, a, of course, under the New Deal, there are all these new government entities that are being created for specific purposes. And infrastructure spending is one of them. You know, Tennessee Valley Authority, for example, is the major electrification project for the you know, whole uh, area of Appalachia uh, and even further into the south. So um, I don't know, but you know, you'd have to look at, at Eccles' speeches to see how, what he thought the right balance was. Now, in the legislation that came forward, he got the centralization he sought so that whatever the Federal Reserve did would be uniform across the country to the extent that this was thought desirable. Uh, and that was that was one of the things that he fought for, that he wanted each one of the Federal Reserve banks in each one of the districts to basically adopt the same uniform policy. Um, and and that that was one way he thought that it would attract investment without what what really is political considerations. Now, so no more actions by someone like Benjamin Strong, who failed to support the Bank of the United States. Um, he wanted to make sure that that Federal Reserve actions were done, were taken on a uniform basis. Well, <clears throat> even so, the nation's economic problems remained really unsolvable all the way into mid-1939, uh, as much of the world was already engaged in war or, you know, of territorial conquest. So beginning you know, with the Japanese attack on, on China, then the Spanish Civil War, everything's escalating toward, toward war and the economy in the United States is still kind of lumbering along. It's not really strengthened. And in 1937, uh, Roosevelt thought that the depression was over. And so he cut back on US government spending and the country went into another went back into a recession. So it was clear then that there wasn't enough private sector strength to get the economy on a sustainable uh, momentum upward. And what was it going to take? Well, it was going to take war, the war to get full employment back. Uh, it's a hell of a price to pay for full employment, but uh, the demand for war materials coming from you know, all the other countries that are now beginning to engage in warfare is going to strengthen the economy. Well, in mid-1939, Eccles went before a Senate Committee on Banking and Currency, and he basically restated what he thought was the need for systemic reforms. He says, the fundamental adjustment in our economic mechanism that is required is the establishment of a better equilibrium between the capacity of the country to consume goods and services and its capacity to produce them. So, so, so Ed, it seems to me that he's proposing various principles, which I think are very, very sound, but not necessarily particular policies attached to particular numbers. Is that a correct assessment? At this particular time, it is. Um, but over time, his, his thoughts change. I mean, World War II is going to change the thinking of many uh, of the economists in the country, 
it's going to change the thinking of Eccles uh, because of, of the apparent recognition that preventing economic booms and busts is going to be a primary government responsibility. So, you know, the idea of Keynesian demand management is going to become the dominant economic theory that's going to govern public policy in much of the, the you know, capitalist world. Uh, and Eccles, uh, you know, I would, I would say he looks, he, looks at, he looks at this as a necessary part of the evolution of, of the role of the Federal Reserve in consort with, with the, the national government, that their dual role is to try to achieve stability. And certainly, and we'll get into a little bit of, of what happens after the Second World War, but as with after the First World War, as the Second World War is coming to a close, everyone is afraid of a recession. What is going to happen when we need demobilize all this military? And how do we prevent a, a serious recession and downturn from occurring? But we're not there yet. Uh, Ed, the, yes. does he, at the time, have any consideration as to what the national debt was? Or was just kind of like, you know, we make the investment, we keep spending. Um, you know. The assumption that, that Eccles had was the same assumption that Roosevelt's economic team had. And that was, we're going to incur, we're incurring debt now, yes. But once the economy is robust, then we can uh, expect increased revenue to come in and we'll pay off the debt. Now, it wasn't that large by comparison to today. Right. And certainly when the Second World War starts, all bets are off. And so, you know, uh, public debt skyrockets, but the priority is to, you know, to uh, defeat, defeat the Axis powers and here again, we get back to the same thing that I, I mentioned about the First World War, and that is that um, the, those who have the most to lose in the war and have the most assets that could contribute financially to the war are very successful at avoiding increased taxation. And so the governments uh, in every country uh, have to resort to debt. And at least in, at least in the United States, um, there were investors in government securities because they could earn some interest and do their patriotic duty. Um, that is not the case in the countries where the war is actually being fought. There is a massive uh, loss of financial resources in France and in Britain and in, even in Germany, where a lot of money is moved out to safe harbors. So a lot, of, a lot of assets make their way through the banks into Switzerland, of course, and into the United States as well. And so during the Second World War, for example, the gold stocks of the United States increased dramatically. So by the end of the Second World War, I think the U.S. had two thirds of the, gold, the world's gold supply. <clears throat> so that, that tells you, you know, the level to which patriotic interest goes when it hits the financial you know, pocketbook. Uh, well, I don't know, does that answer what you were looking for, Bob? Well, yeah, I mean, the thing is, um, I was just wondering from, you know, we had some comparison to what he was proposing and to what is happening now, okay? And I was just wondering, did he give some consideration to national debt level? Uh, how how did the national debt level at that time compare to what our national debt level is now? Okay, um, wasn't any consideration on his part. That was that was my only question. Yeah, I, I'd I'd have to look at his speeches after the war, or at least after 1944 and the Bretton Woods Agreement. Um, that's where Eccles would probably have weighed in, and I really didn't. I wanted to highlight his thoughts okay. on the Great Depression, okay. but but uh, but his his autobiography is is worth reading, 
uh, it, it'll give you a lot more insight. He's, he's a remarkable figure in this period that no one knows about. And so, so I think, you know, he, You're deserved, right, I never heard of him. <laughs> he, 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 he deserves a lot more attention than he's been given. A anyway, as, as the prospects of war uh, among the European nations became clear, I thought this is a great photograph of, of a uh, observer in London. I don't know if this was during the Blitz or what. He's standing on a rooftop with binocul uh, binoculars, looking up at the. I don't know what he's going to do when he sees some, you know, some planes coming. But anyway, uh, European central banks began to ship their gold stocks to New York. So between June of 1938 and June of 1940, 140 tons of gold were transported physically across the Atlantic. Um, I had to get it out of Europe before the submarines uh, were given, were set loose on everybody, or a, or a lot of that gold would have been at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean somewhere. In Switzerland, the Bank for International Settlements, this is a picture of their headquarters, continued to operate in, during the war, uh, even as its board contained central bank representatives of countries that were at war with one another. So, so sitting at these meetings are bankers from different countries whose, country, whose governments are fighting one another and people are dying. And yet in Switzerland, uh, their interests are all being represented at the Bank for International Settlements. During the war, the bank was the recipient of 3.7 tons of gold from the German Reichsbank. Uh, a lot of this gold was stolen from the central banks of Belgium and the Netherlands. Uh, a good, I'd love to find a book, and I know there must be one, on how all of this was worked out after the war in terms of, you know, the returning uh, assets to the, the, the uh, countries that, that, that had lost them through the war to the German, German government. Uh, I know there's still a lot of effort recovering individual assets like paintings and statues and all that kind of stuff still going on even to this day of, of what was taken from, you know, Jewish families and other families, you know, by the, by the, the Nazis. But anyway, uh, it's just kind of interesting, you know, again, here people are hedging their bets, uh, you know, not sure how the war is going to turn out. I better put my assets in some place that's reasonably safe. To pay for the war, government could have simply issued uh, paper currency uh, if it had the power of legal tender and they could spend this currency into circulation. Um, you know, easy enough to do if the government would do it. Uh, we'll discuss this option later in the course as something that's being proposed for today. Uh, but instead, the U.S. Treasury issued bonds that were sold directly to the nation's banks as well to, to the general public. Um, a lot of these were sold in post offices and other public places. And so, you know, there are bond drives all throughout the war. <clears throat> and I would, I would expect that this same process occurred in you know, most other countries. At the end of 1942-1943 fiscal year, about $60 billion of government securities had been sold. U.S. government securities had been sold. So very much, again, the same pattern that wars are paid for by borrowing from those who have the assets and paying them interest. And the interest has to be the money for the covered interest cost has to be raised by general taxation, uh, unless you're simply going to do what I suggested in the beginning, the government simply print currency into directly into circulation. So here's a picture that you will find interesting, I think. Uh, here's uh, two of the main financial brains of the system that was going to become known as the Bretton Woods system. Uh, on the right is John Maynard Keynes. On the left is, is a lesser known uh, individual and I'll tell you a little bit more about him. His name's uh, Harry Dexter White. Uh, <clears throat> and the one thing about Harry Dexter White that you might want to know is that he was, 
accused of being a communist. Really? Uh, yes. And know. was he? Did he? Did he act on the orders of the Soviet regime in his role? Uh, that's still being debated. Really? I didn't know that. Now, uh, as the Second World War seemed to be coming to an end, 1944, uh, Keynes, Harry Dexter White being the two leading uh, uh, theorists there, met, met with all, many other countries at Bretton Woods in New Hampshire to come up with a monetary plan for the future. Um, and all of the leverage at that point in time was with the United States, of course, yeah. because by this time, Britain and other countries were deeply in debt to the United States. And the question is, was the United States going to make the countries pay off these loans? Uh, you know, we're, or we're, were we going to get more physical assets from the debtor countries? Were we going to get more islands and more naval bases and, and that kind of thing? So all of this was under negotiation, and Keynes had very specific ideas about how to set up a new international financial system, a new money system. Uh, but uh, the United States had all the gold. The United States had the, had the uh, potential to help rebuild Europe. And so uh, what Keynes wanted was, was never going to happen. Participating countries in this agreement agreed. Here's a, a photograph of the meeting. So you can see, you know, all the countries uh, uh, in 1944 who could get representatives to New Hampshire were there to talk about it, even, even as the, the war was still going on in Europe and, and in the Asia. So they agreed to pay their currencies to the U.S. dollar at the official rate of $35 an ounce. There would be no floating exchange rates between currencies. The whole idea that they came up with was they had to try to keep all foreign currencies at close as possible to parity with the U.S. dollar, and the U.S. dollar would be paid to, uh, to gold at $35 an ounce. So dollar imbalances based on trade imbalances would be settled between central banks and governments and not by private citizens. So no one, no one in any of the countries would, would any longer be able to take their banknotes to their central bank and get any quantity of, of precious metals for it. Uh, they only, the only movement of gold balances would be between uh, the governments and, and those would be accounted for at the central banks. There were some other parts of this, this agreement that are, that are pretty detailed, but, but that's, that's one of the essentials. Controls were put into place to keep the currency exchange rates stable and a new international monetary fund was established to extend credits to nations as needed. So if the U.S. exports to some country were way ahead of the imports from that country. That meant that that country had many more um, uh, <clears throat> dollars than it had the ability to, 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 to uh, import goods from the, from the United States. And so there had to be some mechanism to get rid of those dollars and vice versa. If, if the United States was exporting you know, a huge amount of goods to a country and they were not ex exporting to the United States, then the United States would be accumulating a lot of British pounds or German marks or, or yen or whatever that currency would be. And it was up to the IMF to extend credits to keep that money from becoming what, what you'd call hot money. Um, for the American, go ahead. Uh, Ed, I think it's important to uh, say what Keynes was in favor of. Instead of having the dollar being the international currency, he uh, thought it would be what he called the bank core. Yeah. And uh, that, uh, and he had a mechanism by which to, on an annual basis, I think, to deal with uh, 
um, deficits and surpluses amongst countries, especially so that uh, newly developing countries could benefit from international trade rather than being the victim of it. Well, I think, I mean, here again, the, the other institution that's created at the same time is the, is the World Bank. Yeah. And, and so the function of the World Bank and the IMF are to try to accomplish exactly what you just talked about. Um, and I, you know, my, my assessment of what Keynes proposed is really what eventually became the euro. Um, and but with this uh, with this distinction there, before I can interrupt one more time, <laughs> and that is that the euro was not an international currency; it was a European currency. Keynes thought that every country should keep their own currency yep. and have the bank or be the only yes. international currency, whereas the euro is both domestic and international. And the reason why it has produced such difficulties in Europe, in my opinion. Yeah, I, um, if you if you read, and it's been a couple of years since I've I've read Keynes's uh, full assessment of the monetary system, he also added this caveat that he thought that Europe should be divided into many many small countries. Yes, and uh, and he thought that that would create the kind of of uh, political stability because no country would have the resources to be a problem for its neighbors. Yes. And so his design of the monetary system uh, was to be conducive to that, to get rid of the economic barriers between the countries uh, and allow, allow a currency to be used for international settlements of trade imbalances. Uh, but you know, I, I, I wondered about how he was going to persuade the governments to give up sovereignty over portions of their territory, you know, and nothing I read in there really was, went ahead to explain how are we going to do this? Yes, yeah. But anyway, yeah, it, um, these are, this is Bretton Woods in itself, if you, if you read, get a book on the debates, on the discussions, it's very, it's, there's a lot of technical jargon that even I don't, you know, fully understand. I mean, there, what came out of it uh, was something called special drawing rights through, yeah. through the IMF. Um, and this gave, supposedly gave to those countries that Alec referred to, that are developing countries, a, uh, a better opportunity to, to bring their economies into modernization. I mean, this is part of what the whole philosophy was after the Second World War. These less developed countries have to be modernized. Mm -hmm. And so the IMF and the World Bank, their job is to help modernize. Them. And a primary way to do this is provide credit for infrastructure development, electricity, dams, uh, bridges, and all that kind of thing. But uh, as we know, some of these projects were undertaken uh, without a whole lot of, of feasibility analysis. Yeah. And so, so. And they, were, and, and they had become very big projects rather than adapting to the local economy. We, exact, exactly. We uh, exported our, the technology from the West as if the developing countries are identical to the West and we didn't adapt them to the conditions of the developing countries, so they could, couldn't take advantage of these uh, uh, of these loans. There are there were a lot of mistakes made. Uh, the question is, is for historians has been: uh, Were these mistakes uh, ideological, or are we simply a failure to fully analyze the post-war needs of the world? And you had, you know, a lot of a lot of people who became sovereign after the Second World War, uh, became independent of their, their imperial uh, domination by European powers or by the Japanese, et cetera. And, and we're starting out trying to re rebuild. Well, these international systems that, that uh, were designed at, at Bretton Woods arguably facilitated the, the 
the development of these countries, but it also imposed on them some rigorous uh, requirements that they weren't able to live up to and didn't have the political stability necessarily to see uh, put into play. Giannis, I think your hand's up. Yeah, uh, do, do you know of any study or uh, of the, the special drawing rights flows to different countries and how these connect with actually real specie or real, like let's say dollars? <clears throat> Because there's a, there's a, there's a recent debate, a debacle in, yeah, in, in a, Ellen and Kennedy. And I'm, uh, if, I would appreciate if you have any Kemmerer, material to help. K-E-M-M-E-R-E-R. There's a monetary historian who, uh, who's written uh, a book about this. He's written a couple books. But, um, but I, I look him up uh, and uh, I can't remember the exact title of the book. I have it downstairs in my shelf. Can you spell but, his name uh, slowly once more, please? But I think he, he K-E-M-M-E-R-E-R. -E -E someone, someone who has their iPhone handy can probably look him up on Wikipedia real quick. Um, we're, on my, we're at 8 o'clock. Um, I have yeah. a bit more to cover, but, but uh, I don't want to keep you all. So I'll just... I'll, I'll finish up with this section uh, just in a minute or two and let you all go. But, but I, you have to think about how much the global economy was just uh, pulled, pulled apart by the Second World War. All of the relations, the institutional relations, were were dissolving. The 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 relationship between countries in the world was, had totally changed. The domination of, of, of Britain at the top of the economic uh, you know, uh, power structure was replaced by the United States. And so what did that mean for the monetary system that was going to be put into place? In the United States, rationing and price controls had done something unexpected. It had enabled Americans to save an average of 20% of their disposable income. So remember what I said, one of the big fears after the Second World War was, were we going to have a global recession? Well, at least from the United States point of view, uh, there was a huge pool of savings that could be drawn upon to meet the consumer demands. And with Mariner Eccles at the head of the Federal Reserve System, he was going to try to make sure that there was going to be adequate credit available for people. Um, there were other things that happened as well. The United States uh, Congress, in its wisdom, decided to create benefits for veterans. And so we had the GI Bill of Rights, which provided low interest no down payment financing for veterans who were going to acquire a residential property and they would be able to get, you know, uh, fixed rate financing over 30 years, which made home ownership affordable for millions of families who before this, before the Second World War, who would have never been able to get, uh, you know, financing for, for buying a home. So that dramatically increased the the, uh, the demand for housing stimulated the housing sector. Um, and so the same thing occurs with regard to infrastructure. Thanks to the Second World War, um, there was a development of the road systems and rail systems in the United States, linking markets together in a way they hadn't previously been linked together. Uh, <clears throat> the, the interstate highway system, begins, uh, President Eisenhower was the, is when he becomes president, he is the one who really stimulates the spending on the interstate highway system. Well, what do highways do? They dramatically increase the value of land in and around any interchanges. And so the land use pattern changes and we begin to see in the United States the development of the suburbs. And so what do you need if you live in the suburbs? If you're not lucky enough to live in a city that has uh, a commuter rail, then you need an automobile. 
By 1960, three out of four households in the United States own at least one automobile. And so from a domestic standpoint in the United States, there's a tremendous increase in the consumer spend in consumer spending and the financial system has to change as a result. And the one thing I'll leave you with to think about is you can thank Joseph Stalin for the recovery of Europe. Why? Because if, if Stalin had not uh, made it clear what the Soviet intentions were in terms of territorial expansion, the United States may never have implemented the Marshall Plan. At the end of the Second World War, there were plenty of people who wanted Britain to pay off its debt right away. Uh, oh, and, and, and Britain was not able to do so. Um, so thanks to Stalin, the United States said, looks like we better help uh, you know, Britain and France. And, and of course, we have to help rebuild West Germany uh, and even Japan. Japan, yes. So you know, it, it wasn't so much that Americans cared all that much about what happened to their allies after the war until Stalin made it clear uh, and Churchill made it clear in his speech in Missouri that the Soviet Union was, was planning to expand and take over and destroy uh, democratic participatory government, participatory government wherever it could, that the United States finally came forward with its uh, credit plan to help rebuild Europe. Now, was it totally altruistic? It wasn't altruistic at all, because where did uh, the countries that received spending uh, credits from the Marshall Plan have to spend their money? In the United States. <laughs> so uh, that's where we'll, we'll pick it up next week, uh, a little bit more on, on, on this history. And then um, I'll, I'll start to go into the whole debate over monetary reform that occurred once the Bretton Woods system collapsed. And, and of course, most of us are, are young enough or old enough to remember when Richard Nixon was the president of the United States and he decided that we would no longer uh, be uh, victimized by the gold, by the gold exchange standard, or by the Bretton Woods Agreement, and and things really changed after that. So, any any questions, comments? We can chat for a while. I'm 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 here for you if you want to talk. Yeah, I have to leave because my wife is. Uh asking me when we are going to eat for supper. <laughs> so, and Yanis, I'll, I'll uh, call you or, or write you, perhaps not tonight, but tomorrow. Maybe. He has his microphone off, so I don't know if he's, he's yeah. he has any knowledge hearing you. Yeah, uh, I understand. And Ibrahim, I, can, I unfortunately had to miss uh, the, the third session last uh, time. So uh, can you send us the recording for, for that one? Oh, yes, definitely. I would uh, email you the link. Yeah, that's Alex speaking. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. And Thanks, Ed, just uh, very, very interesting stuff. Obviously, a great deal of uh, work has gone into it. So yeah, I've thought about I've, I've thought about doing a book, but uh, I don't know. With the visuals, it makes it more interesting. I don't know if I can write a book that would be in, would be readable and interesting, uh, but but uh, I, I I do think there's there's so much more that we could discuss. And as I said, it would take a year to cover all of the the you know the details of what went on. But you know the the one message that I would bring to this course is that. Um, the kind of thinking that's going on about what sort of monetary system we ought to have has been constantly evolving. It's been constantly challenged. It's been challenged from an ideological perspective. 
uh, from those on the left and on the right, and from a pragmatic perspective by, by those who are just trying to figure out what the right balance is between uh, monetary issuance, the availability of credit, how to use these tools to achieve economic, sustainable economic growth. And now that we have environmental considerations very much in play, what's the role of, of institutions like the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank or even the Federal Reserve in the United States or, or the Bank of England or any central bank? Um, well, what bank what obligations, Europe. pardon? Well, the Bank of Europe. Yeah, That's yeah. That's very crucial. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and we, you know, just mentioning the Euro a little bit, I mean, the main, the, the main, one of the main problems with the introduction of, uh, of, of the euro was that each country had its own fiscal system, its own, its own budgetary system. And so how do you use one monetary unit, you know, in a, in a situation where, where every participant is sovereign over its own basic financial affairs? Um, no uniform system of taxation, et cetera. Uh, so I, I think that that's, that's one reason why uh, critics, particularly in the UK, said it's time for us to get out. You know, that there are just too many uh, parts of this system that we can't control. And therefore, domestically, we're losing our sovereignty. Anything else you'd like to chat about before we break up for tonight? Hi, Ed. Uh, Joe Plito here. Yes. Um, I left a, a link in the chat to, um, I think it's Richard Roberts, the economist who wrote Saving the City. And uh, he covers the period 1914 to 1918. And it had a lot of the different progressive measures that you referenced. In it, they they bought um, they bought the banks' toxic assets when before the war, and they were losing uh, a lot of their customers who ended up being on the uh, the enemy in World War One. And they did uh, they uh, kind of secretly bought war bonds so they could fund the war. Um, they suspended the gold standard. They issued the Bradburys. Uh, and then after all that, that time, um, they were faced with a, a pandemic even worse than this one. Uh, I think they yeah. came out of that with a, a huge uh, GDP deficit, but um, there were so many lessons to be learned with that particular series of events. And then in the Great Depression, as you mentioned, all that stuff about gold, I think England got off gold very quickly and their depression was far less serious. Like the gold standard apparently contributed greatly to the depression. So I understand it. And yeah, uh, it, well, for the, the British uh, recognized their mistake, as I said, and by 1931 uh, were, you know, were no longer uh, you know, honoring the gold standard. And I, and I think that's largely to the credit of Keynes advice to the government, but you know, it, um, you know, you, you mentioned the, the flu epidemic in 1918. I didn't, I didn't think to, to include anything on that, but certainly um, that had a major impact on the you know, economies of, of many countries after, after the First World War, trying to deal with the, you know, with the disruption that occurred. So, yeah, that you're definitely it was a good, Good thought. If I teach the course again, I'll have to remember to put a couple of slides in about the consequences of the flu epidemic. Well, hearing quiet, I'll assume everybody is satisfied that we've covered enough tonight. And I hope you've, you've gotten something out of this, learned a few things. And I appreciate your, your attendance and I hope to see you all next week. Until then, have a real nice week. Bye-bye everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Bye. Bye-bye.